for the novelization of Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones in 2002, Del Rey chose to bring back R.A. Salvatore, the author of the first book in the New Jedi Order series. I'm a little bit surprised that Salvatore chose to return to the Star Wars universe because his reception from fans was so decidedly negative after Vector Prime. But Salvatore fleshes out the story of Episode 2 with both deleted scenes and original scenes to the novelization. Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones made it to number two on the New York Times bestseller list for the week of May 12th, 2002, and was ultimately on the list for seven weeks. As I was rereading Episode 2, I wasn't sure if I found these extra or expanded seeds familiar because I was remembering my initial read back in 2002, or if I just found most of them familiar because they have appeared as deleted seeds in either the DVD or the Blu-ray releases. And like with the novelization of episode one, episode two had two different covers available. The first had Anakin and Padme on it, and the second had Yoda with his teeny green lightsaber. The only difference between the novelizations of Episode 1 and Episode 2, though, was that that second cover, the Yoda cover, was released over six months after the release of the first cover as a special collector's edition. So, a brief summary. 20-year-old Anakin Skywalker is coming of age during a time of great upheaval in the Republic. As thousands of systems leave the Republic to join Count Dooku's separatist movement, the attempted assassination of Senator Padme Amidala spurs the Senate towards a path of no return. And unbeknownst to the Jedi, a conflict is brewing with thousands of clone soldiers ready for the ultimate fight. If Terry Brooks's novelization of The Phantom Menace utilized both deleted scenes and Brooks' own original plot lines to expand the story of Anakin's life on Tatooine before he meets Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, Salvatore's novelization of Episode 2 likewise fleshes out events that occur before the movie, such as Smee's life with the Lars and Padme's relationship with her family, as well as relationships within the film that are given a little more time to breathe in the book. And for that, I include Anakin and Padme's romance and the interplay between Jango and Boba Fett. But this is a novelization, so Salvatore has to hew pretty closely to George Lucas's story and specifically George Lucas's screenplay. So we do have that cringy dialogue that appears in episode two, as well as some of the very hectic plotting that appears in the movie also appears here in the book. As we saw in Alan Dean Foster's The Approaching Storm, Anakin is really chafing under the restraints of the Jedi Order. He's 20 years old, he's been a Padawan for 10 years at this point, and he thinks he's ready to be a Jedi Knight. He thinks Obi-Wan's holding him back, that the Jedi don't trust him. So this solo assignment to take care of Padme Amidala sort of proves to him that the Jedi are willing to give him responsibility to see what he does with it. But Anakin's also a bit of an emotional mess. He meets Padme again for the first time in 10 years, and he's instantly flirting with her, a little bit creepy in the process, being really pushy, knowing that the Jedi Order does not condone attachments, but pursuing her anyway and also unwilling to give up that attachment he has with his mother to the point that he's really concerned about her. He thinks that these dreams could be prophetic when the Jedi, specifically his master, don't seem concerned about them. He takes matters into his own hands and takes off back to Tatooine to find out what has happened to her. Anakin's relationship with Obi-Wan is a lot of bickering. 
Some of it's good natured, but some of it, particularly during the chase, where they're chasing the assassin Zam Wessel, feels a bit like people who have been together far too long and are starting to break a little bit under those constraints. I think that Anakin loves Obi-Wan, sees him as this paternal mentor figure during episode two, but he also feels like Obi-Wan doesn't trust him, that Obi-Wan should be giving him more responsibility. This famously comes out in a scene very reminiscent of Luke whining about how he wants to go to Tashi Station, where he says to Padme, he won't, he doesn't trust me, he doesn't let me do, he's holding me back. And I want to say to Anakin, Anakin, I'm sure that there are Jedi your own age Padawans who are going through the trials, becoming knights. But you've only been training to be a Jedi for 10 years. All those other people have been training since they were toddlers, essentially. So maybe, like, take a step back, look at your situation, recognize that it is different from pretty much every other Jedi in the Jedi Order and maybe give a little more grace to your master. But at the same time, looking at Obi-Wan, I think I could see how he was sort of pushed into training Anakin that this was something his master, Qui-Gon Jinn, wanted to do. After Qui-Gon Jinn's death, he took it upon himself. But there's been almost an essential mismatch between Obi-Wan and Anakin from the start, that their personalities are completely different, and that can be a good thing because they could learn from each other, but by the time we reach this point in time, it almost feels like the two of them are just frustrated with each other, that Anakin is frustrated that he's not given enough responsibilities, treated like an adult, and Obi-Wan is frustrated that every thing he tells Anakin, pretty much it seems he gets pushback from. So perhaps it's best that Obi-Wan gets to do a solo mission of his own, get some time away from his Padawan, a time to just chill. And the other Jedi, specifically the Jedi Masters on the Jedi Council, are struggling. Apparently everything they see is clouded by the dark side, their force abilities are not as strong as they used to be, and everything that's happened since, I guess, episode one, The Phantom Menace, has had the Jedi one step behind everything that's happening. They can't predict what's to come because of the Sith, they caught Darth Maul, but they absolutely do not know about the existence of Darth Sidious, has left them stumbling in the dark. Things happen and they have to play catch up. Somehow a clone army for the Republic was ordered. They had no idea. It was 10 years ago and they're just completely thrown by this. When I think about the Jedi of the prequel era, I think about Jedi who are merely reacting to things that go on around them. They don't have control over the situation at all, and as the story progresses, it just spirals out of control. It does make the Jedi feel ineffectual at times, that all these bad things could be going on behind their backs and they have no idea. Like, Really, the root of all evil is on Coruscant, the same place as your headquarters, and you don't know? But there's something in here where Mace and Obi-Wan talk about the only way you can really see into the dark side is to open yourself up to it, and I'm not sure that's something they're comfortable with. So I guess it does make sense why this is happening to them, even if I do feel like a lot of these things are, if not their fault, something they could have mitigated. Like, the situation with Anakin absolutely could have been addressed differently, more empathetically, but I guess they have a blind spot that they just can't see. Like Anakin, in a way, Padme is struggling with what she wants out of life. She has been a politician, from a very young age, since she was a child, she was a queen at age 14, she's been a senator for years, she's only 24, she feels like what she's doing is important, 
but at the same time she has her family who repeatedly ask her, don't you want a family? You've given enough to the Republic, don't you want a life for yourself? And so meeting Anakin is that spark for her to be why can't I have both? Why can't I do great things for the public, serve in politics, but also have a relationship, maybe have a family one day? I do think this is somewhat creakily or messily done. I think it inadvertently comes off as sexist that Padme can't have a job and a family at the same time. Like that's what her family brings up, like she should leave politics and have kids because she loves kids and like Padme's only 24. True, she's been in politics since the time she was small, but she's a very young woman and I don't think there is this dichotomy that she could either be a senator or she could be a mother. She needs to drop one or the other. Like this is Star Wars. This is a very high-tech society, surely she can do both. Seems to me like the arguments with her family just exist to sort of push her towards Anakin to make her consider Anakin as a romantic partner more than she might have if she didn't have those thoughts already running through her mind of like, oh these years are slipping by, you need to pursue your own life. Uh, it does somewhat make her sound like, I don't know, a Jane Austen era spinster that she's given up her life to a cause and who will want this poor withered soul? But again, she's 24. Jeez, give the girl a break. And we see Smee's life on Tatooine, the events leading up to her abduction, what happens afterwards, and then all the scenes that we actually saw in the film when Anakin and Padme land on Tatooine. Smee's happy, she's found a new family in the form of Klee Lars and his son Owen. She loves Beru, she thinks Beru will be a nice addition to the family, but at the same time she's still yearning for Anakin, wondering what happened to him, hoping he's safe. I think the scenes with the Lars family and Smee are a little treacly sweet, but they're nice to see. They're nice to see that she was happy, that she was freed, she hasn't been a slave in years. Before the Tuscans kidnap her, she's tortured for weeks and Anakin finds her right at the end and then, you know, kills a bunch of Tuscans. And then over on the bad guy front, we have Django Fett the bounty hunter who hires Zam Wessel, the changeling assassin, to kill Padme. And it turns out he's working for the Separatists, but he's also the genetic model for the clone army that Master sifo commissioned for the Republic ten years ago. And as payment for this, he wanted a clone for himself who he's raising as his son, and this is Boba Fett as a small child. I like how Salvatore fleshes out the relationship between Django and Boba, that Django legitimately does want family, but he also sees Boba as an attempt to see how much better he could have been, that if he had been supported, if he had had a loving father, if he had been given all this training, all this education, how much better as a bounty hunter could he have been? And I do think that Django and Boba's relationship works better in the book than it does in the movie. We don't get much to go off of in the movie, but in the book we have additional scenes with them, and just getting to be in Django and Boba's head really helps. And the big bad villain of Attack of the Clones is Count Dooku of the Separatist. A former Jedi, he left over 10 years ago because he was dissatisfied with the Jedi Order and dissatisfied with the direction that the Republic has taken. He has since risen to prominence as a politician, the head of the Separatist movement, So as much as I enjoyed what the novelization of Attack of the Clones added to my understanding of the film, there were also a number of issues with it for me. The first is that it hews 
very closely to the film. Like I said, that awkward dialogue is included. And this is one bit where I felt like Salvatore could have taken a little more liberties with it, especially once you add the deleted scenes into it. This is pretty much what you see on film, just written down. The writing is a bit pedestrian, it's a little awkward at time, it's very readable, but it's not poetic. I'm probably unfairly comparing it to Matthew Stover's novelization. It's the story, it gives you more insight into their heads, but it's not remarkable, quotable, where I would be like, look at this line, look at this line. It works, it does an okay job. I also feel a bit like in giving us more insights into Padme and Anakin's relationship, their thoughts about each other, Anakin comes off a little bit creepy and a lot of it is Padme feeling uncomfortable about Anakin and Anakin just pushing and pushing and pushing and he's not disrespectful, he's not rude about it, like when she says no he backs off. But just the fact that we're inside Padme's head and she's like, oh, I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable, like, uh, I don't know, I guess that's the thing, Anakin and Padme are like this wartime relationship and during times of war, people will pursue relationships faster because they don't know how much time they have. But I guess seeing inside Anakin and Padme's head more made me just a little bit more uncomfortable with their relationship and the speed of it. I also felt like the action scenes suffered a little bit here in the novelization. I did not think they worked as well as they do on film. The chase for Zam Wessel, Obi-Wan's fight against Jango on Kamino, and then especially the last few chapters on Geonosis were rushed. It was hard to follow the action at times. Sometimes, especially the Zam Wessel chase, there was too much repetition. Like, Anakin does something reckless, Obi-Wan screams. Anakin does something reckless, Obi-Wan screams. And like, that's a bit much. You could have cut some of those out. Yeah, and just tying into that final battle, the end, Geonosis, part of this is the film, everything happens very quickly. But this is one bit where the novelization could have fleshed things out, could have given time to breathe a little bit more. But as it is, it's just a few chapters. It goes really fast. It's, you know, they're fighting in the arena and then they jump on the ships and then they're chasing Dooku and then they're fighting and then Yoda turns up and then, and then we cut to the epilogue and it's like, begun these clone wars have and the troopers are loading and we see Anakin and Padme getting married and that's it. And like, I would have loved to see the conversation that Anakin and Padme had to decide to get married. I would have loved to see maybe a little bit more talking things through after Geonosis. A hundred Jedi show up and we're told at one point that only 20 are left standing. Like, that's a huge loss. But it felt like we had a few pages for Obi-Wan, Mace, and Yoda to talk. And then just like a page to see the troopers get loaded and bail or God is like, what have we done? And Sidious, well, Palpatine is like, <laughs> and then the wedding and that's it. And I would have loved more because that's what a book could do. A book could give you more. Like the epilogue doesn't have to be exactly what you see on screen. So in short, R.A. Salvatore's novelization of Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, gives us more insight into Anakin and Padme's head. It gives us more leading up to Shmi's abduction by the Tusken Raiders. It gives us a little bit more insight also into characters like Jango Fett. And I appreciate that. I appreciate getting to dig into their heads a little bit more. Yes, there's the cheesy, awkward dialogue of the film, but hearing their thoughts helps mitigate that a little. But at the same time, I felt like the writing is just okay. I wish that Salvatore had taken it further, that we had gotten more insights into other things. The action scenes are hard to follow, they just honestly can't hold up to what happens in the film. And the ending is rushed. I definitely wish we could have gotten more time to linger and reflect on things that happened before. 
So next time, I'm going to be reading an ebook novella about Lumpy, Chewbacca's son on Coruscant, A Forest Apart by Troy Denning.